Hi, welcome to Minds Behind Maps. I'm Maxim Lenemand, and this is the latest episode in this experiment where I want to sit down with people who are creating and using anything geospatial to try to understand more about the field and the people in it. Today, my guest is Charles Blanchet, the Vice President of Solutions at ISI. This is a bit of a special episode to me for a few reasons. First of all, this is the 10th episode that I released for this podcast. So I wanted to take a little moment to say thank you to anyone who spent some time out there during their day listening to this podcast. I started this earlier this year because I wanted to know more about the people behind the cool projects, the maps and the companies I heard about. It's been a really fun journey. I've learned and I keep learning a lot through these conversations. I hope you find these conversations interesting as well. The second reason why this is a bit of a special episode is that I used to work quite closely with Charles. As you might have heard from previous conversations, I also used to work at ISI, and I actually joined only a few weeks after Charles did. I have directly worked on some of the projects we are going to talk about in this conversation, and I've seen firsthand how the decision-making process happens. I no longer work at iSight, but I still believe in what the company does. I have ties with people there, and I think the company has great potential. I wanted to talk with Charles and hear him explain the work he's doing and the vision he has, mostly because when I was working, that's already what I was trying to do, and I just wanted to formalize this a little bit more. To bring in a bit of context, ISI is currently a company that operates Synthetic Aperture Radar Satellites, SAR for short. SAR is a form of radar imagery that allows mostly to see through clouds and at night, which is helpful for one of the most applications that ISI is trying to solve, which is flood monitoring. I wanted to talk to Charles as to why ISI has decided to focus on flooding, because I think Charles has some valuable viewpoints that I feel like I haven't heard much about outside. This conversation isn't really focused on the technical aspect, but rather on finding the right problem to solve. Charles has over 20 years of experience in building startups, and a lot of that experience is in data companies. We go over the difference that comes from operating a space company and how launching and operating satellites doesn't make things simpler. I really enjoyed this conversation because Charles and I have very different backgrounds, skills, and views, yet we work in the same field. I believe that in this context, having the room to ask simple and naive questions like I like to do it leads to interesting conversation and usually means getting exposed to new ways of th seeing things. We don't talk just about SAR and startups. We also talk about taking the de dedicated time to think. I've noticed multiple times throughout working with Charles that he seemed to have thought out specific issues before they came out in conversations. And... I wanted to know a little bit more about how he approached thinking as a dedicated activity. As a side note, this is also the second in-person conversation I was able to have. As I allude to in the end of this episode, my home is slowly turning into a recording studio. And now that I think about it, it's actually the second time I have a VP from a SAR company at home, though I don't think I'll be able to hold that pattern for a long time. It's really fun to have conversations in person, though. As always, you can reach out to me by email. That's at minds.behind.maps at gmail.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Max Letterman. You can also follow news related to the podcast also on Twitter at Minds Behind Maps. Putting podcasts out there is a very one direction channel of communication. So I'd really love to know what you think about these conversations. In the meantime, here's my conversation with Charles Blanchet. <laughs> Hi, Charles. Uh, thanks a lot for coming here. Thanks for being on the, the podcast. Um, every time I start this podcast, I ask, as I told you um, before, uh, I ask the same question to everybody. So I'm going to ask the same. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. <laughs> That's a good one. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. How would I describe myself? <clears throat> I would describe myself as uh, a passionate man. Um, I tend to put myself all the way into whatever it is that I'm doing, um, whether that be friends or, um, or family or work or, uh, a hobby. <clears throat> I've been told I'm kind of intense. Okay. It's, it's a double-edged sword for sure. Um, uh, caring deeply about things. Um, but, uh, you know, also compassionate. Um, I certainly feel for people. Uh, quite a bit. I enjoy feeling uh, and have an empathy for people. 
Um, I would say that I'm, um, I live a pretty um, non-standard life, I would say. Okay. What do you mean uh, by that? I've, you know, traveled a lot. I've done some pretty wild jobs. Um, I have a very diverse group of friends and people I, I keep around. Um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I just kind of, I've been single for, for four years. So that's allowed me to just kind of do some, um, you know, whatever I wanted, uh, for the last four years, which is a luxury. Um, Yeah. That's how I describe myself. Right. And so how did someone, you know, who's passionate, who's intense, who's had a bit of a different life, how do you end up to where you are right now, which is um, VP of Solutions at ISI? I'm very curious, how does that happen? And why are you a good person to, to be there? You know, it's funny, when I, I talk to my boss about um, me joining the business, it we would joke that everything I had done up to now had prepared me for this job. Um, <clears throat> so I've, you know, spent the last 20 years uh, bringing to market early stage venture backed B2B technology startups. Uh, ISI is my fifth official one, but I've been a part of many. Um, and, you know, uh, I, uh, the first half of my career was in software as a service. So, okay. you know, learning subscription businesses, you know, I've only uh, worked at subscription businesses. So annual recurring revenue is what everybody's always after these days. And <laughs> those so three magic letters. Yeah. Those three magic letters that everybody's uh, looking for. Um, <clears throat> so only done that my whole career. Um, and in the beginning I focused a lot on government. Okay. Uh, so, you know, certainly what we do right now has to, you know, is linked to the government. Um, and then I, you know, the uh, one startup ago, I was in my first data business. Uh, I've been in analytics businesses. Um, the data business taught me a lot. My, my boss there, he really helped me understand, like, you know, understanding where you fit on a value chain is like really okay. important. And you have to be aware of that and, and harness that as a strength and, you know, uh, and uh, mitigate, you know, against some of the weaknesses of exactly where you sit on the value chain, but know where you sit on the value chain and, and, uh, you know, pay close attention to that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've been, you know, my work with government and government contractors, you know, prepared me for working with insurance too. You know, insurance okay. is a, a tough market you know, that we're focused on. It's a tough market to address. You have to be patient and, and you know, uh, you have to have empathy for them and the situation that they're in, just like when you work with the government. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with co-founder dynamics quite a bit. Okay. Um, you know, as I mentioned to you at lunch, uh, uh, you know, I feel like my job has been <clears throat> largely about finding product market fit, you know, and, and aligning, um, you know, the target market with marketing, um, sales, customer care and product development. And, you know, when you're, when you're running revenue at an early stage, uh, company like this, you know, that that's what it's all about. It's about finding that product market fit and, and, you know, just getting those, all those things perfectly aligned so that, you know, it becomes easy. Um, right. And, uh, you know, once you get it, you know, just right, you know, it, it slots in. Um, and, uh, you know, that's when the magic happens. <laughs> this is something that I, I was really excited to be able to, to, to talk to you about. And I'm glad that you brought it up at lunch and you're brought, bringing it up here is this notion of, of product market fit. Um, I work and, and I'm interested in the earth observation field and like how to s seeing like how do we develop the tools around it to make it useful but I haven't thought a lot about even calling it product market fit to like who can we serve and so I'm very curious how has that experience been for you finding that product market fit for ISI which is this company that generates data and a lot of it so how has that journey been and and how have you approached it about finding that product market fit when arguably there aren't any other company that's done it at this scale that you are trying to do yeah i mean it's been one of the joys of my career uh, honestly to be a part of uh, that journey here at isi um you know i i came into a situation in which, um, and you, you might recall um, this, uh, we joined similar times. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, where 
you know, the business had already gotten the satellites up in orbit. Um, you know, they had two healthy lines of business uh, where they were selling the imagery and they were, you know, we were selling the, the satellites themselves, the mission side of the business. <clears throat> and then there was this like solutions area, which is a big part of the investment thesis, you know, um, uh, in, you know, for, for our board and investors. And, you know, it was largely undefined when I got there. Um, you know, at the time, we were experimenting with every use case. And, and right. there, there are uh, dozens and dozens of things you can do with synthetic aperture radar data. You know, uh, we were looking at things like understanding oil spills or seeing if oil pipelines were leaking or detecting pirate ships or measuring the height of copper stockpiles for the commodities and, you know, financial services and commodities industry. Um, <clears throat> so it's, a, you know, it was a huge... Um, diverse set of things that we could do. And I really enjoyed just taking calls, you know, and talking to everybody from mining companies to, you know, uh, firms on Wall Street right. and hearing about like what they wanted to do with this data. Everybody's pumped up about it, right? Like they see the potential and you get, you know, you're pulled in all these different directions. But, you know, I was lucky I had, you know, I, at the time I had 19 years of experience in like Silicon Valley startup stuff. And certainly Silicon Valley teaches you that you have to focus and you've got to become the best at something in order to really right. build a build a market uh, and become very valuable. And so, you know, uh, I, I had the opportunity to assess all of those use cases. Um, I think there was about 50 of them and just put them through a strategic analysis. You know, okay. we looked at the the strengths of our company at ISI, you know, we had these synthetic aperture radar satellites. Um, we can, you know, see through clouds. We can see at night. We can see through smoke. We can detect small changes. We can get there fast because of, you know, the way our orbits are set up and the volume of satellites that we have. And, you know, I got a chance to kind of evaluate all those different use cases and industries through those strengths. Then we looked at the size of the market that we were uh, right. looking to disrupt, basically. And, um, and then the competition that was in, in that uh, market space. And what was amazing to me, and I was very happy to see this, is that the combination of floods and insurance and government like popped up to the top as being in line with our strengths, a large addressable market. And the competition was like human beings going out and like examining things with clipboards. Um, but the, to me, the icing on the cake was that we actually you know, instead of helping like maybe the mining industry, you know, be yeah. better at what they do or, um, you know, helping people, you know, um, you know, make more money in the financial services industry. You know, we get a chance to help human beings when they're most in need, you know, right. after these crises. And, and I was just, you know, so happy that, you know, we landed on something that was, you know, meaningful to society. Right. So, um, this might sound like a very naive question, but I want to ask it nonetheless. You mentioned that in your experience, focus is really important. Why is focus important when you're building something compared to trying to reach out to everything that you could do? As you were mentioning, when I joined as well, it was like a lot of different applications. Why is that not the way to go? And why would you want to have focus? You know, in the beginning in a startup, you just don't have resources. You know, okay. even if you've got a bunch of capital, um, which we did at the time and still do, um, you know, uh, to build a product is unbelievably difficult and, and to build one that like is the best in the world and that people can use successfully is unbelievably hard. People really underestimate how hard this is and the discipline that it takes. You, you have to say no to so many things every day. I feel like it's kind of my job, unfortunately, and it's it's actually, I, I'm sure it's very annoying to people because right. you know what what ends up happening is um, startups is not start being in a startup is not a career path, like you know okay like when I hire people I don't get to say oh I want to find somebody that understands this environment like I'm usually hiring somebody for their expertise in some field or okay. some discipline, and but you know what happens is that startups you know people <laughs> they they join them because they think it's going to be exciting and it certainly is, but it's grueling work and it's stressful work and it's personal work and it's emotional work. And what people usually end up doing is they dip in for a couple of years. They have that experience they, to check that box and they never go back to it again. <clears throat> okay. Because it doesn't pay well. There aren't perks. I mean, the perks is the work. 
right? Like you, you're not flying in first class. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't have, you know, you don't have the ability to take off multiple weeks of vacation because it's just too critical to be at work. Um, and so what ends up happening is that everybody in the startup, uh, except for me and a few people I've seen in my career are amateurs at being in a startup. And, you know, I feel like while I don't like, I'm not an expert in floods or satellites or insurance, um, but I am an expert in focus and, right. and, and getting people like kind of rallied around one hard thing. And unfortunately I get to, I have to be this guy, the no guy, the, you know, cause there's, I mean, ideas are easy like to say, Oh, let's do this right now. Oh, we should experiment with that. Or let's just try this other market. And then people don't understand that you just signed up for like 2000 hours of work, <laughs> like one decision. Right. And then what happens is that 2000 hours of work, you know, on this random idea that somebody had, or even if it's a hundred hours of work, like it, it's not going towards the focus. Right. And you just get divided. Right. And so if you don't, in order to birth a product into the marketplace, you have to take all of your energy and focus it on, you know, choosing the right market, um, you know, creating the right product marketing and, and packaging and pricing and, and message the right, you know, sales, you know, what type of sales are you doing? Is it indirect? Is it direct? Um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, what kind of, how are you taking care of your customers? How are you making your customers successful? What kind of partnerships are you going to have? And what product are you building? You have to line that all up just right. And, and that's what you're doing in the beginning. You're just like tuning, right? You're constantly tuning all those functions so that they work well together. And I, and I feel like that's been my career is, is like kind of working with those teams um, to get them all focused on the same thing and get them configured in a way that creates, like I said, magic. Right. I think a lot of the times um, I, I come from like I studied in working in the space sector. Um, it was in mechanical engineering. Now it's more data science, but it's still the space sector. And I think a lot of people who have been in that sector think it's special in a way and uh, something that kind of has this little bit of magic. I'm curious if you think that's also the case or not, because the way I hear you talk about it and, and we've worked together for a while is is quite different. It's more about taking a lot of the experience that you had and just applying it to something that's, there's actually a lot of common commonalities um, on that. And I'd be curious what you think about that. Like what I think about, you know, the space industry in general? Is or? it like, is Earth observation specifically, because that's what we're talking, is that like any different from the other experiences that, that you've had on the other, um, in the other fields that you've worked? It's still data. You mentioned you worked in data before. Is it really that thing that's different or is it just something that we just haven't spent that much time in yet? It's definitely different <clears throat> in, a, in a number of ways. So the technology footprint of our company is shockingly large. Like, I, I mean, there are, we have products that I don't even like internal products, a lot of internal products, um, you know, that I don't even know about. Right. You know, like I, I, it took me a while to realize that there's this massive software organization within our company. <laughs> and I'm like, but we don't even sell software. So what's going on? You know, like, mm. I mean, there's, there's a lot that goes into, you know, building, you know, components for spacecraft, assembling them, um, you know, launching them into orbit, managing that constellation, targeting things, downlinking. And guess what? That's when, you know, after all that's been done, that's when the solutions organization that, that you and I were a part of, that's when our technology footprint takes over. And, and you, know, you know, what we do is we, you know, we take that imagery, um, we mix it with a huge cocktail of third-party data. Um, we then apply machine learning and algorithms to it. Um, there's a hunt, multi, it's like a hundred pages of workflow that coordinates many teams across this whole process of, of identifying and acquiring imagery for floods and then producing, you know, flood depth and extent data that a regular company can consume. I, I just, I was shocked. Like the technology footprint compared to like a software, like a typical Silicon Valley software company. I mean, we're talking checkers versus chess, like us right. know, obviously being the chess and a regular just SaaS company <clears throat> is uh, checkers. But, you know, this is, let's talk about like one, an example of like where this like really helps. 
So being at a space company, um, it's really great for finding talent, right? I mean, it's just the right. hot thing that everybody wants yeah. to work for. So recruiting is easy. Getting meetings with governments or insurance companies, for example, pretty easy. You know, people are curious. They want to know, like, what's going on? But, you know, space is also pretty unforgiving, you know? And so if something, it's so funny, before I got into the business, I'd never thought of, like, what if something goes wrong with one of the satellites? Like, does, like, a little you know, spaceship kind of pull up next to it and like a little arm comes out and it like repairs it. No, like you've got to like figure out how to fix things that are broken in space using a fairly limited set of, you know, communication channels. Yeah. I think a good analogy might be if your grandma calls you because her phone, her laptop's not working and you can't go there and you're like, <laughs> all right, grandma, you're going to have to do this to try to fix it yourself. It is really hard. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand that for sure. Yeah. I, th I think people have triv trivialized two things. People have trivialized just how hard startups are, for sure. They glamorize okay. it. They think it's this fun, sexy thing. Then you, you know, spend a couple of nights working in the garage, and then the montage of music comes on, and next thing you know, you're flying on private jets. Um, it's not that. And I think people have uh, maybe not trivialized, but like romanticized space, and you right. know, don't realize just how hard it is. Um, you mentioned that. You mentioned SaaS, so software as a service. Is that a good model, in your opinion, for what data is trying to do? Like, not just Earth observation, but we're moving towards companies generating data. And obviously, ISI is one of those that creates a lot of data that has a lot of value. Do you think this SaaS model that I think we've heard a lot about with like in the past decades where like a lot of companies started and they're like, that's the model that we're going for, like recurring revenue. Do you think that makes sense for the types of company that iSight is? So, I mean, certainly from a commercial model, um, uh, you know, recurring revenue uh, is, you know, much better for any business yeah. because, um, you know, the valuation uh, of your company is somewhere between, you know, at the worst, like eight times your recurring revenue base at the best I've seen, you know, 20 times your recurring or more, um, your recurring revenue base. And if you are doing one-time contracts, um, then you're going to get, you know, something like, you know, one or three X your revenue. So just in terms of making your life easier yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and the journey that you're on, um, these are, you know, very capital intensive businesses. So you need to pump, you know, you need to get a good valuation so you can keep bringing in capital at a good uh, price. Um, but you know, it's also, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, I like the relationship with your customer, you know, more because it's a right. long term, you know, you're connected, you're building things together, you're building always on capabilities together. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, the reason why recurring revenue is valued so much higher is that you don't have to keep earning the business, right? right, right, right. Like you just, you set up the contract, you know, hopefully you keep an auto renewal clause in there. And, you know, uh, it, it just keeps renewing, you know, what you want to do is you want to have like, you know, somewhere between like 90% and a 110%, uh, you know, retention on your revenue, mm. um, the 110% by, you know, kind of growing those yeah, yeah, contracts. Yeah. Ours, ours, uh, our, our client growth is, is actually, um, uh, larger than anything I've seen. So like, usually when you're selling software and SaaS, you kind of, your first deployment is like the big, uh, deployment that drives the most, um, uh, revenue, uh, and then you kind of incrementally grow, grow it <clears throat> because what we're doing is so new and unique. People end up you know, doing like a tiny test, um, uh, yeah, with yeah. us and then we slowly grow it to scale. And so actually our, our, um, you know, our, our upsells or, you know, kind of the growing of the contracts is where the majority of our revenue can come from, which, you know, you know, motivates us to be unbelievably, you know, um, responsive and, you know, attentive to our clients, you know, right, right, we've right. got, we've got to make them successful. I actually wanted to ask as well on, on that, because that's so important. You mentioned that space attracts people and it gets the interest of, of potential clients as well. Does it ever backfire where you're like a company is like, we don't need a space company to solve mm -hmm. our problem. Um, I wouldn't call it backfiring. <clears throat> so what I've experienced in insurance, it's interesting. Like our, we, 
we have a pitch deck that we you know use to get people fired up about what we do. Um, and a, about 20% of my goal with that pitch deck is certainly to explain to them that we are a space company and we have these space assets, but we're not going to treat you like the last space company you worked with. Because right. almost every insurer out there and a lot of the governments have done these experiments with satellite companies and those satellite companies has have handed those insurers or those governments imagery and has said, figure it out. You know, you figure out how to derive information and value out of this imagery. And I would say that they failed almost 100% of the time. And so the first, you know, the first, you know, 30 minutes with somebody, yeah, it's like, get excited. We have these capabilities. We have these assets. But, you know, we're not that, that company is, that's right. going to expect you to figure out how to hunt a flood with the, the constellation. Because just finding them is bigger than any startup I've ever been a part of. Right, right. Um, and then, you know, we're not going to expect you to make the multi-million dollar investment. And that's what it is. Like, in order to figure out how to derive useful information even once, you know, out of a, out of a flood image, you're talking massive investment to do it right. Like at least a million dollars per use case, you know, investment in third party data, processes, software, tools, you name it, people, uh, systems. It's, uh, you know, deriving value out of imagery and, and, and turning it into information is a tough business. Right. One of the things that I've heard a lot in, in the few years I've been working in this is that also, this is, I'm very biased. It's, it's because I see the technology point of view and I see it like, okay, we've kind of figured out how to make a dashboard with that image that shows you something. Um, but finding like how that integrates and how that's useful for someone, I think maybe that's also what you meant by, by product market fit. How has that experience been where you're like, okay, we have this information. Let's let's talk about the flood, for example. We, we have that information. How has it been then to be like, turn that into something that's actionable. Yeah. I mean, the journey has been really interesting and the journey is still in front of us. Um, but you know, in the beginning it was, okay, what industry and use case do you point at? Um, it became floods, insurance, and government. Um, we call it the column of focus. Um, uh, it's, it's blossomed into all natural catastrophes. Right. Okay. Um, but then the next big question was, where do you sit on the value chain? <clears throat> right back to that what you were mentioning earlier yes so um do you build software do you you know um do you uh have a data utility do you build reports um you know what is it that you're you know there's a lot of even when you pick floods and you and you say you're going to observe them there's an entire value chain to select from yeah, and yeah. and what what we did is we <clears throat> looked at the situation and we said to ourselves all right, let, let's look at how they're managing floods today. Um, there is no shortage of software there. there right. There's tons of software. And what you don't want to be, well, it's uh, what, what I would prefer to not be focused on is, you know, ripping old software out of companies and having to put new systems in because that's a multi-year process. Right. It, 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 and sometimes people just are so, you know, in love with their tools and products, right, right, like right. they won't ever, you know, they, they're not going to leave them anytime soon. So, you know, we decided to go as low on the value chain as possible, which is a weird thing to say. Okay. Um, usually you try to be like very high value, you know, but, um, <clears throat> so we, you know, figured out, you know, we decided that we were going to produce raw data that will flow into the existing systems. Um, but you know, uh, and so it's, it's, it's like a spreadsheet, uh, honestly, and right, is, right. is one of the products and uh, a more sophisticated version of that is a raster file and a vector file. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the insurers love the spreadsheets, so, <laughs> so do the government. It's very familiar to them. But then what the most, the next part of this journey, like, so we were all patting ourselves on the back um, uh, up until about a hundred days ago. And it dawned on me that we, we needed to do something else as well in terms of focus and, and understanding that like perfect mixture of you know product and sales and marketing and customer care and and all that <clears throat> so we you know we're very 
you know, proud of ourselves that we focused on floods, you know, and we did build an always on global flood monitoring um, solution, which is, you know, the first time that's ever been done. And it's very exciting and people love it. And, you know, we did decide, you know, like, yes, we got to be at this level of the value chain so that we don't like end up having to like, you know, compete against all this stuff that's out there. But then we've just realized that we had this like, you know, I was, I was proudly saying, oh, we're just a data utility. You okay. know, you, here, here's the data. You can do whatever you want with it. And it's amazing. There are many, many use cases. And, and what's nice about being low on the value chain and not doing software is you can plug the data into a government and you can plug that same data into an insurer, direct insurer, a broker, a claims adjuster, a reinsurer. All these diverse peop, uh, groups of stakeholders can all use this data for all kinds of stuff. And you don't end up having to do a bunch of product development, or, you know, when you go from a reinsurer to a broker, for example. But there's a problem. And, and this is something that we ran into about 100 days ago, is it's so open to possibility that the, the, the clients and the prospects didn't know what to do. Right. It's like, you know, like, I mean, we would walk out of a meeting and we'd be like, oh my God, they have like 20 ideas, you know, that they want to do with this data. And so we're actually going through an exercise right now, which is uh, fascinating to me. It's a product marketing exercise where you need to like actually create, you know, um, you know, certain uh, use cases around the data and you need to actually build a solution around that data so that it's tangible and people can understand it. And, you know, how we're going about this is we are, you know, looking at it through the lens of, you know, how hard is this or easy is this to implement at the customer? Okay. Right. If this is like a, you know, going to disrupt a bunch of people and you're going to have to like kind of you know, transition to like dr dramatically different systems and stuff like that. Why don't we make, let's, let's put that out a year or two, you know, okay. like, but what, what, so what are the use cases that are easy to implement? That's the first thing we're looking for right now. And then what are the use cases that are the highest value? And then lastly, we're, you know, it's a new product, right? It's not perfect. No, no data product is. And so the last vector that we're evaluating is through the lens of how much pressure does this put on our data? You know, how perfect does our data have to be? And so, you know, at the end of the day, what we're going to end up with is we'll look at it through the lens of difficulty to implement, you know, how much value is it to the customer and like how fit for purpose is our data for it right now? And I'm hoping what we can come up with is like, you know, three to six like core use cases that we can bundle up with like, you know, uh, marketing messaging, um, you know, uh, value propositions, all that, uh, you can create, uh, customer success, best practices around it. Mm -hmm. You can target like, um, you know, very specific niche, um, business partners to bring in. Right. So for example, think about if we, if we were to select, um, before, during, and after communications, uh, excuse me, before a natural catastrophe, yeah. during, and after a nat natural catastrophe, communication to the insureds, communication to the citizens, communications to the leadership at the insurance companies and at the governments, that changes who we want to partner with. Yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, we need to partner with people who, there are niche companies that, that do communication before, during, and after a natural catastrophe, and they've got the software and the tools and the right. mobile apps and the text messaging and the emailing and all that stuff. Yeah, that's that's what I was going to ask is like, I, I can imagine that it's it's not, and I think that's just a, a general problem that there is in these companies that are trying to bring analysis. It's not necessarily creating it. It's delivering when you need it. I think floods are such a visual example. If you have a, a nice dashboard that you need to be on your laptop to look at where the flood is and your house is underwater, <laughs> um, that's great, but that's probably not super useful. What if the internet is down or things like that? I'm, I'm sure that's, more than a technology problem it's understanding how to solve the specific problem that you're trying to solve yep yep and so we've, we've got to pick a, a couple of those yeah and it's just this amazing journey right like i mean if you recall like we start with like this huge possibility yeah we we really thought we had focused like you know and we thought the focus was over like it's like okay now let's just go to it and then we discovered that we actually had with this one data product that we were producing this one spreadsheet let's call it so the flood one the flood one yeah. the 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 depth of the flood you know uh, attached to a building id but guess what on the client side there's 50 products that you can you know solutions that right. you can implement into their business 
And that is overwhelming uh, for the customer and for us. We can't build a product. We can't market a product, sell a product. We can't support a product that has 50 use cases. Right. We can't do that well. I mean, I thought it, I mean, the vision was like, oh, we can just be this like simple product, data utility, hang it out there. They'll figure it out. But the reality is that these businesses, the insurance industry and the disaster response areas of government are unbelievably complex and, you know, highly regulated. And, you know, I mean, like literally when we think about, you know, doing what we want to do uh, and converting FEMA, the disaster response agency in the United States, it will literally take an act of the U.S. Congress to do what we need to do because wow. they got to change the rules. Mm, right. I mean, there are rules that say human beings are supposed to go out and look at things. Right, you know? right, right, right. And sometimes it's 30 different people, you know, go and look at the same house. Like I've seen diagrams where like, you know, it's like, uh, you know, a bunch of different people from different agencies are knocking on the door and we want to consolidate that and just, you know, automate it with data. And that's literally going to, you know, when I think about FEMA, it's going to take a coalition of partners right, right. that come together and we got to get really focused, not on floods, but on specific use cases in in our clients, uh, and you know, again, that focus, like get right, all right, right. the energy focused on nailing these use cases. What I find so interesting is that this, to me, doesn't sound like a technology problem. It sounds like what comes after that technology problem. Um, I want to ask this question: Is there a way where you can end up with? too much of a focus where you end up opening, all right, we, we, we look at all the applications, we decide flood is the one. So you open there, you think you have that, you open that door, it turns out there's 50 other doors to open. And you're like, okay, we need to choose like two or three. And then you open those and then you realize there's maybe like 50 other doors there. And then is there a point where like it's, it's too much or like, how do you deal with that? Yes, uh, for sure. I'll give you an example. Um, two startups ago, um, we we decided to focus uh, so we were struggling uh, at this particular startup we were in the business of uh, helping uh, government contractors understand how government spends money um, and you know uh, you do all kinds of pivots over the years at these you know these startups and you know something starts to work so you double down on it you know, all, all of a sudden something's not working. Okay. We got to rethink and, and maybe like regroup and redirect. And, and sometimes the decision is to focus. Like, it's like, right. Oh, you know, we were going after 700 clients and, you know, a younger version of myself overcorrected. And like through one of these decisions, we decided to focus all of our energy on 10 big clients. And I had a pretty big sales and marketing organization. And we just absolutely blew the doors off these companies from a sales and marketing standpoint. And we overcorrected, we overfocused. Okay. And um, it actually was very annoying to those 10 clients having imagine. like 30 people kind of crawling through them on a day-to-day -day basis and marketing the heck out of them. I mean, like they couldn't right. go anywhere online without seeing our ads. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it was, you know, and we, we literally got blacklisted at one of them and for good reason. Okay. Um, but yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, having now 21 years under my belt doing this startup thing uh, and also being, you know, my personality type I mentioned to you is, is very like kind of passionate and energetic. And I, I've been called a light switch sometimes. Like I go from, you know, I can go from, you know, totally on to off on something uh, to the extreme and that right, there's right, right. good thing, you know, that's served me in my, in my career, in my life. And it's also uh, hurt me in my personal life mm -hmm. and my, in my career. Um, so as I'm getting older and, um, you know, uh, wiser and more patient, um, and more experienced under my belt, I'm learning to calibrate the focus. Okay. And, you know, so when I looked at like, are we over focusing by just focusing on floods? Hmm. Um, well, uh, you know, where is the diversity that's going to de-risk the situation for me? Well, I, I look at it like, okay, well it's global. So I'm not, at least not stuck in one economy, you as know, in and global, I'm not, as in, in the world. Yeah. As in like to? the clients are global, right. right? They're on every continent, every insurance is everywhere. Yeah. Right. And just turn on the news and floods are everywhere. Floods are unfortunately everywhere. Um, natural catastrophe, certainly everywhere. And so it's like, okay, first things first, we are geographically diverse. Okay. That makes me feel a little safe. Um, we are going after two sectors, a government sector and an insurance sector. Okay, good. These are pretty stable sectors, you know, like governments don't, don't go yeah, out of business and insurers. Stick around. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most of the clients that we have are a hundred years plus in, right. in age. So, okay. I feel safe about that. And then I was like, okay, well, we can actually even diversify within those two markets. So, you know, government has uh, a federal, at least in America, it's a federal level, a state level, and then, you know, local government levels. So you can diversify there. Um, and then within insurance, there's, you know, brokers, reinsurers, um, direct insurers, claims adjusters. So we have diversity there. And so, and then, you know, what if there's just not enough flooding or going on or something like that? So we've diversified the product as well uh, by focusing on all of the natural catastrophes. So through all those different kind right. of, you know, uh, product segments and market segments, uh, I, I look at it and I'm like, okay, yeah, like you don't have all your eggs in one basket as an example. So you like where you guys are right now is, is a good balance of that having that column of focus that you were mentioning, but still not to the point where it's just like these 10 people that you were mentioning earlier. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We have, um, you know, there's thousands of prospective clients in front of us. Now we, we, we are focusing on, yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on, on not all of them, of course, you know, we're trying to focus on the most innovative, um, uh, prospective clients, uh, and ones that are focused on the things that we are, we help with. Um, but yeah, uh, and, and you got to balance it. It's interesting. Like we did just focus on, on a particular, you know, pretty small number of uh, prospective clients, but very immediately in the plan is to figure out how to, you know, get back to addressing the entire market because right. of that lesson I learned back in the day. You know, that's, that's the nice thing about having, you know, 20 years of bumps and bruises and startups is like you've, I've made, uh, I would say at least half the mistakes that I can make or have already been made. So you mentioned actually earlier that like people come into startups, um, they do it for a few years and then they go back. But you also mentioned that you're uh, one of the few people who does that over and over again. So what's the appeal of doing that over and over again? Why have you decided every few years to say, that's what I'm doing again? You know, I would say it's... I think my whole life I've done that to myself. <laughs> so uh, chosen a hard path is, is kind of the way I would first describe it. Um, and chosen, uh, you know, the particular job I have, it's, you know, when I was playing baseball as a kid, I was the pitcher um, because, you know, I got to be, you know, center stage. Dumb question. What's the pitcher? Oh, sorry. The, the person. <laughs> yeah, I forget. Um, so it's the the person that stands on the mound and throws the ball at the batter. Oh, yeah, yeah right. That so pitches the ball. Spotlight's on you. So that's, okay. that's been like the, you know, I wrestled, I played tennis. It was always these sports where you were like, you know, it was just you. And, and it wasn't really a team that like, you know, was, was going to win or lose. It was all on you. And so that's why I feel, feel like I've chosen... I enjoy that. It's like a, okay. I guess it's a bit of a, I'm addicted to the adrenaline of it, you know, where it's like kind of all on you. It's, I mean, obviously there's a huge team yeah, yeah. and, you know, there's tons of people contributing to the business's success. Um, but, you know, I, I am responsible for um, kind of, uh, you know, the success or failure. Um, so, you know, that's why I've chosen the position is I, I enjoy um, you know, being responsible for, um, kind right. of success or failure and the startup thing, you know, um, I'll think back a little bit, you know, why, why well, this goes back to 1998, 1999, when I was like rushing through college, you know, I graduated college in three and a half years. Um, and because I couldn't get wait to join the the internet thing that was happening, you know, the dot com thing that was happening. And I, you know, I, I finished school and I saved up money and I moved out to California to be a part of the dot com boom. I unfortunately literally moved there the day it ended. Uh, so April in 2000, for those of you that were um, alive back then and uh, aware of what was going on, that was when the whole stock market just kind of fell apart. And I got out there and all the companies I wanted to work for had gone out of business, had completely gone out of business. I was literally, I remember, I'll never forget, uh, knocking on the door of this company called Live Person. And it was a company that was like, had agents that were going to like help you on a website. If you couldn't figure something out, you literally hit a button and a human being would come through the speakers of your computer. And keep in mind, this is before broadband. So right. it just yeah, was yeah, never yeah. going to work, right? <laughs> or it was going to work maybe 10 years later. 
Uh, and I knocked on the door. I was like, oh, I'd love to work for live person, you know, and I, you know, I just cold called him. I, you know, I walked in with my resume and there was one guy and I was like, hello, you know, and there's just a bunch of empty desks. And, uh, you know, this guy, you know, he comes up, I was like, uh, so, uh, you know, here for, you know, see if I could get an interview. And he's like, man, I'm just selling the furniture. <laughs> wow. Uh, so yeah, it was very tough times. And so, you know, I'd gone out there to join a startup. I'm very thankful that I didn't because I think going to a startup first thing out of school is a really bad idea for your career and where you can pick up some really bad habits. Oops. <laughs> uh, says Max. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, I didn't get a chance to do it immediately. I got my break like four years later after working for some big companies, which I, I'm really happy that I got that. Like I got to see how it, how it's supposed to look when it's successful okay, right? Yeah, right. at scale. What is a company supposed to, how is it supposed to behave? And I was able to bring that into the startups that I initially went after. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it started, you know, from a pretty young age, I wanted to be a part of a technology startup. I wanted to be a part of the internet. Um, I do, I, I think I, I naturally enjoy going to market and sales and, and marketing and stuff like that. Um, but you know, it's, I, I gotta say, it's almost like an addiction. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I took a year kind of off and worked in venture capital Okay. and I'll never forget how tired I got. And okay. It's really weird. So I, and I was working from home mostly before I, it was cool before it was <laughs> before it was cool. Yeah. And I remember taking two naps a day. Um, I was an independent contractor. It was, a, I mean, I, I was making money by the hour, you know, so I was allowed to do that, which was nice. But because I wasn't like in that, like almost fight or flight zone of, of birthing a company and, you know, doing everything I can to make it successful. Um, I got tired, like literally and had to take naps. Okay. Like the, the, the day that we experience in these early stage startups is not a normal work day at all. Yeah. It is, it is, um, I call it an adventure. Right. And so I guess the, to go back to the question, like, you know, I've always wanted to be a part of like bringing one of these companies to market, you know, had a chance to do it five times. Um, I still want to take one public, which I've never done. And that's probably why I keep going back is I just don't feel, I kind of feel like, you know, an, an Olympic athlete that's been to the Olympics five times. This is like, maybe, you know, my knees are getting a little weak. <laughs> But, you know, I've never, I've never won the medal, you right. know? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, so I, I really, really want to, you know, I, I have this vision for being, you know, being next to the group of people that, you know, made it happen and hitting that button on the stock exchange and hearing the bell ring. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a, that's a very important goal to me. Right. That's, I, I see, I love these because. I, I, we were talking about that for lunch. I never know where people go with their answers. And this is why I love just letting the mic roll. And cause, cause I love just the journey of where you, you took me there on that answer, which I think is, is, is really cool. Well, you're, um, you're forcing me to think about things I haven't thought about in a long time or ever some, some of these things. So, uh, yeah, yeah th it's, it's fun. I take that as, as, uh, a pride. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to backtrack a little bit. Um, you've, you've touched a little bit on this, uh, uh, at some points, but I, I really want to ask it and, and take the time to, to go over it. How do you build uh, a team? How do you build a good team? Um, especially in, in what you're doing. I have a lot more technical um, background. I understand a little bit how you do it there. I'm really curious to hear from your perspective. Um, I know you you have some thoughts on that. You've I think you've wrote an article even on like how you you hire people, and I'd I'd really like to go over that. Like, what do you look for in building a team? Um, at Isai, you've built like a, a pretty big team as well. Um, so I'm just really curious. What's that process? What do you look for, and and how do you do it? How do you think about it? This is one of the hardest parts. Um... And the reason being is in the beginning, you don't have any blueprints. You know, if you go work at salesforce.com, like they know exactly who is successful in every role. They've got it mapped out, right? Because they've got this long history 
of success and failure behind them. And so they've got the formula, right? right. So in the beginning, you're creating the formula. Um, and so I've found that the most important thing to first do is to go do the job yourself. So in the beginning at ISI and every company I've ever been at, I was business employee. Well, ISI is a little bit different. It's bigger. It's got multiple business lines, but within the solutions organization, um, myself and this guy, Sam, um, who was an intern at the time, um, who saved, saved my butt many times in the beginning. Um, he and I just sat next to each other and did the job <clears throat> and we did, you know, we hunted the floods in the beginning. I mean, I remember him and I looking at weather models. I mean, we're not meteorologists by any stretch of the imagination. And we were like literally trying to figure out where to point the satellites using what's called a spaghetti model. And I didn't even know what that meant really. Uh, so you got to go do the job. You got to go. I, I do the sales at first. I work closely with all the teams and the work that, you know, the marketing and the customer care and, and you got to go like experience what it's like. And then you got to step back and you got to say like, okay, What's the functional expertise that I need? What's the industry expertise that I need? And what type of person, right. personality type, cultural, do I need to bring in to be successful? And I got to say in the beginning, you're kind of guessing, you know, like you don't have, okay. there's no, you know, every position I'm hiring right now has never existed at ISI before. Right. And we're doing something that's never been done before. So there's just so much uncertainty um, you know, we're hiring a global head of sales right now. And it's like, what am I looking for here? Like, am I looking for the person that like knows everybody? Am right, I looking right. for an executive? Am I looking for somebody who can drive the deals themselves? Or is it, you know, am I looking for somebody who just really knows how to collaborate? Well, like, I don't, you know, there's, there, there's <laughs> nothing, there's no blueprint yet. Right. Right. And so, you know, what I generally look for is, you know, they got to know the function. You can't teach somebody how to do a function in this environment. There's too much uncertainty already. Ideally, they know the industry because I have never gotten to be an expert in the industry and I can't in any industry. Like I, I'm just a startup guy, right? Like I'm the right. only person I know that's, you know, focused on zero to the first $30 million in recurring revenue in a company. And so I have no industry expertise, so I must have that, you know, uh, especially when you're customer focused. Right. Um, but then, you know, the soft stuff I'm looking for is people that can overcome and, and work through adversity. That's why in that article, you know, I, I explain uh, that I ask people to tell me their life story because I need to see like what they've been through. You know, I've, I've interviewed people and I'm like, wow, like, and, and I ask, uh, I asked somebody once, like, what's the hardest thing you've ever been through? And this person told me finding an apartment in San Francisco. <laughs> I was like, oh boy, like this is going to, you know, this is way harder than that. Trust me. Um, so I look for people that have overcome adversity who have a very, you know, like no matter where they're at in their career, they need to have a high trajectory, you know, like, right. uh, you know, if, and if you started out with being given a lot of things as a young person, well, you better have gotten pretty far along, you know, uh, or you have to, you know, no matter, everybody starts somewhere, right? Like you might've started dirt poor, you know, where you had to like, you know, get student loans for your education and maybe you had to immigrate somewhere, you know, like you, you hear those stories and you're like, okay, this person knows how to get through yeah, something, yeah. you know? And, and then, you know, but you also hear stories who were, you know, given all kinds of privilege who had to get, get through a lot of yeah. things. And so I just look for that. I look for ambitious, hardworking people and the other thing is like, it's really important that why do they want to do this? You know, it has to be tied to something bigger because you're not doing it for the pay. You're certainly not doing it for the work-life balance. You're not doing it for the perks because they're very few. Why are you doing this? Why are you subjecting yourself to this emergency basically? And, you know, what I like hearing people say is, you know, things like when I'm, when I'm hiring people that are further along in their career, you know, I look for things like, this is a checkbox for me. Like, I've got to do this. I've been, I'm, I'm a leader in what I do, but I've always worked at these big organizations and it's never been mine, you know, and I just want to create something from scratch and I want to own it. Like, that's what I love to hear. I just hired a gentleman that's uh, running our government practice and that was his story. Like, he wanted to, he was like, I want it all on me. You know, I'm like, yes, right. it's going to be all on you because, right, right, right. you know, like, there's no one to blame, you know, here um, when it doesn't go right. But then when I look at younger people, 
and earlier, you know, people earlier on in their career, you know, I'm looking for that person that says, well, someday I want to start my own business, you know, and I want to see how it's done, you know, things like that. It, it, it's not for the pay, right, right, right. you know, it's not for the lifestyle. It's so, got to be for something big. Yeah. It's really interesting because what I hear from that, it's it's more about the person than, like, there's obviously their, their knowledge and, and skills, but it seems like, at least when we talk about it, it's a lot focused on who that person is and, like, that drive that they have, maybe more than, like, the actual thing that they know how to do. Yes. So, so the person comes into play because this is so personal. Um, right. What ends up happening is I would say almost everybody that is on the team I'm in right now probably cares more about their job than they've ever cared about it before. And it's not because of me. Um, it's because of the, you know, of how, how much it, it means to them because it's their work and it like, they can see that their input is creating something and making right. a difference. And it becomes very personal to people. And this is a good thing. And it could be a bad thing. Like I've seen people get so into it that they can't let it go. Like literally, right. like y you can't go on vacation and enjoy yourself kind of thing. So you can easily burn yourself out because of how much you care about the cause and the mission and your contribution to it. Um, people, can end up, you know, when, when you care deeply about something and you feel as though it's being threatened, people can react in funny ways. And, and, and it's, this is just part of this. This is just part of the journey. Like, I mean, you, you, we will experience that many times over every person in a early stage startup, you know, that's really going for it. Usually venture back stuff is like kind of amped up, you know, and you know, you've got big goals to hit in very short periods of time. So yeah, I mean, like, I personally, I get so wrapped up in it sometimes that, you know, I'll be like, you know, uh, replaying something, a meeting that I had earlier in the right, day, right, I'll right. replay it like 20 times in my head, kind of beating, why, why did I not ask that question or right, something, right, right, whatever right. it was. So yeah, in that article you referenced, I talk a lot about, you know, how personal this is. Like one of the things is uh, at one of my startups, they called it the Charlie test in a recruiting environment, which is you've got to want to be able to, you've got to want to get stuck with the person you're hiring on a 10 hour flight and coach, you know, sitting next to them. Um, you know, that's because you're going to be with them that much shoulder on the boulder together. Um, you know, when you're a leader in, in this business, you don't just like put goals in front of people and say, go figure that out. Yeah. Like it's, you can't, you can't expect people to do that. You have to do the work with them. And if you're going to be working that close with each other, you got to like the person just as much as they've got to be successful. Right. This is, I, I remember reading that article and, and liking that um, airplane check. I, f I forgot exactly how you had mentioned, but thinking like that is such an interesting question. I never thought about it. And it, it was one of those moments where finding something clever and being like, oh, I'm stealing that. <laughs> and like Please re do. Really being like, oh, that's such an interesting uh, question to ask. And also that that 40 minute like moment where you ask people about um, their life story. I, I was actually looking forward to this interview to kind of ask you that same question. We've covered quite a bunch of stuff um, already about, about some of your life story. But if you'd be willing, I'd, I'd still like to ask that question and I, I'd like to, to hear you um, at least fill in the blanks on, on some of those moments, um, to starting from, from wherever you want and, and kind of ending it wherever you want. But based on those um, interviews and, and the questions that you've, you've asked and the answers that, that you've had from people, I'd be really interested. And it's been like, I don't know whenever I first came across that article, but I was like, I really want to hear Charles on that. And it's been <laughs> however long that I've been really curious about that. So I'd, I'd really love to, to hear you more on that if you, if you feel like it. Uh, my life story. Yeah. Oh boy. It's a very simple question, right? <clears throat> <laughs> All right. Um, so I grew up in Georgia, which is not the country, the, the state. state in America. I remember not... the first time we talked, I was like, Georgia? What? <laughs> I had somebody come up to me the other day at the office 
and she was describing this Georgia dish, this food, this like bread and this cheese oh. and this stuff. I was like, and she's like, yeah, like I had, I had, I had this dish from, from, you know, where you're from last night. And she just, and she kept on talking about it. I'm like, what is she talking about? Did I go, you mention always like where you're from and never Georgia or? <laughs> well, I, I don't know how she'd picked up where I'm from G Georgia, but like, you know, and she's describing this, you know, dish from the country of Georgia and I was just like completely perplexed. So yes, now now that I live in Europe, uh, I do need to qualify uh, the the state in Georgia, um, which is a southern state. Um, so uh, you know, really good food and and funny accents and stuff like that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I grew up an only child, okay. um, so uh, I think that actually resonated. It st stuck with me. Um, you know, I, I actually enjoy being on my own quite a bit, and I can entertain myself pretty pretty well. Um, you know, I, I was not very successful as a human. In fact, I was kind of a misfit uh, up until about 13. Um, I was on the wrong path. Uh, I ended up uh, moving in with my dad who was, gave me a little more structure. Um, and what was interesting, you know, was I got a chance to live, um, both kind of, uh, a little bit poor and a little bit well-to-do in my life growing up. So seeing both sides, I think was it's, it's, it's the way to go, right? Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. to experience, you know, both being, you know, not having money and having plenty of money, you know, it, I think it rounds you out quite a bit. Um, but you know, what that gave me was like drive, like, you know, like having, you know, having times in my life where I didn't have that much. Um, when I, you know, when I moved in with my dad, um, it was like this, like kind of new life I got to start. And I just, I went after it, man. Like I, I kind of missed out on the early childhood education and I was a little bit behind. So I had to like just work so hard to get B's and A's. Um, and it was flashcards, man. My dad taught me flashcards. I don't even know. Do you know what that means? Yeah, like like cards with like the question and yeah. answer on it. And B's and A's, you're talking grades, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I had to work hard to get, um, you know, A's are the best in America and B's are like kind of the next level below. And so... You know, I was working, I was working hard for what a lot of people would consider, you know, kind of below, you know, excellent. Right. Um, but, you know, you know, grinded through college. I, I never took a semester off. Uh, you know, I studied business at the University of Georgia. Um, had a great college experience. I mean, it's like the classic U.S. college with the football stadium that's over a hundred thousand people in it, and <laughs> you have these crazy games on <clears throat> on uh, uh, you know, game day where like you know the whole town changes into something else, um, and it was you know it was it's just like it was like the movies, um, but you know I, I I should definitely mention that I started working when I was eight years old. Okay. Um, my first job was uh, moving bricks, and it wasn't even a job. Like I just walked down to a construction site and I was like, can I work for you guys? And I, I would say I was in th maybe fourth grade. So I guess, I don't know, maybe, maybe I was 10. And I think they were just like just messing with me. I was like, I'll work for whatever, you know? And they gave me uh, 10 cents for every brick I would move or something like that. I mean, they had a forklift. They could have just moved the bricks with the machine, but I, th I think they were just like, all right, we'll just give this, you know, see if this guy will move, you know, $10 worth of bricks at 10, 10 cents each, you know, like, um, you know, and I was very frustrated because you weren't allowed to work at the mall until you were 16. Oh, and so yeah. that forced me to like, uh, my first business I started was the triple C car wash, uh, <laughs> with, uh, Kaysen and Clayton, and Charlie, the three C's, and we would go door to door and we would sell people on, on washing cars. Um, I would, uh, I was a maid. Um, I cleaned office buildings and houses. And this is, this is before I was 16. Um, I didn't have to do this. I just like really loved work. <clears throat> right. And, um, I loved starting little businesses. You know, I started a landscaping company that the car washing kept going. I had a window washing business in college, me and my dear roommate who I'm still friends with Brian Barber. Uh, he and I started a, a cafe on campus called the addiction cafe where we sold, uh, coffee, pizza, and cigarettes. Like I, mean, <laughs> I didn't even have a license to do this, but it was Georgia. So you were allowed to do things like this back then. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, uh, in my adult life, uh, I, you know, obviously you've got a chance to be a part of these like venture back startups, but I've also, uh, you know, started my own, uh, companies as well. 
Yeah. Uh, so I started uh, um, when I was uh, 23. God, think about like focus and all the mistakes I made. But uh, I started a company called Improve Safely uh, that was ahead of its time. Like this is 2003. Um, I wanted, I did that trip in Europe. I told you about with the yeah. URL pass. And this is after like my, uh, my first success in business. I'd made some money and I was taking some time off and going to Europe. And I was, you know, part of the trip was to dream up some business. Okay. Oh, you're not going to believe this. I haven't thought about this in forever. So I'm here in Europe as a 23 year old guy with my friend KT and we're just bumming around and I kept hearing about Americans being overweight <laughs> and so and stressed and working too hard and having high blood pressure. And you know, this is the way, at least back then, the way people were just, you know, talking with me as Europeans and I'm an American and this is what they're talking about. And then I was reading about America from afar and, and I said, okay, I want to start a company that helps people with this, you know? And so it was uh, called Improve Safely and it was a software application um, that would uh, interview you and it you know through the lens of are you stressed are you overweight um are you trying to quit smoking um are you trying to quit caffeine like those were my entry points and what i had done is i had diagrammed all the symptoms of these things uh down to the core problems and this website would interview you through this logic tree and at the end right. it, would, it would recommend products um group sessions or one-on-one -on -one sessions with professionals. And man, I mean, I still have the logic of this thing on a, on a CD-ROM somewhere. That's pretty cool. Uh, but it was, it was good. I mean, I, I wish I, you know, I wish I could go spend five minutes with the young version of myself and yeah. talk to him about what he should have been focusing on maybe, or, <laughs> um, you know, and uh, I started another company called, um, it had several names started, um, it was called I want and then turned into buy for work. Man, this thing was genius. Like I, again, I wish I could go back and whisper just one thing in my ear. Um, but it, you would put into this website what you wanted to buy and it would just go find options for you. And then what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a social buying experience where you could bring your friends in, like bring your buddy in that knows how to buy like cars or something or computers. And like, cause I don't know how to do that kind of stuff. And you create this, you know, page that you can comment and vote things and bring options in. Right. Um, if I could just go back and whisper one thing to myself, I would have just said like, put like the crowd, the uh, people behind it and don't try to build all the technology at once. And it would have seemed like magic. Mm. Like if, if I would have just had like, you know, mechanical Turk kind of, you know, uh, folks on the, on the back end of this thing while we were building also cool technology, um, Similar to how we operated ISA, I mean, I, you know, I, I think, you know, those those moments where you decide to put humans in the loop deliberately and you decide to not build like technology, is uh, it's great. It takes a lot of pressure off of things, and it also, I think, it gives you the freedom to make mistakes and be more nimble and stuff like that. But getting back to the story, I mean, obviously, you know, work has been a, a big big yeah. part of my life. Um, you know, I think I've, I feel like I've prioritized my work. Um, and like we were talking about at lunch, you know, like when I, you know, the rest of the story is like me hanging out in San Francisco, being a part of these amazing startups, you know, hanging out with like really close friends, most of which I, I, I have from high school and middle school and college. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, that kind of leads me to, you know, I've been engaged twice. So there's, there's another fun fact. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll kind of take you to you know, like how I, how I wound up at, at ISI. Yeah, that sounds um, great. You know, so I, I, I mentioned I, I took, um, a year to, to work in venture capital, which was great. I made some great friends. I had a great mentor named Q, um, still a good friend of mine. And, you know, I, I think it was his plan all along to get me into one of his portfolio companies. <laughs> Uh, he, uh, he didn't uh, come out and just tell me that, but he was, you know, kind of shopping me around and I had a chance to do some work with, um, ISI, uh, on the investor side. And I got to know, uh, Rafal, the CEO, who's just this amazing man way beyond his years in terms of maturity, high emotional intelligence, and quite a visionary and quite a businessman. Um, he's 32, which is amazing. Um, 
And, you know, I came across ISI and on a personal level, you know, I had felt really stuck in San Francisco, California, you know, like you consider it like the big leagues of startups and, you know, you can kind of say to yourself, well, how do I, how do I go somewhere else after you've played right. in those big leagues? You know, like, where do you go? Chicago or something like that? I mean, the startup scene is just not the same. The capital that's involved, the, the, the level of talent is not the same. Um, and I was just so excited to, I remember the first morning I was in Finland and, um, it was this beautiful cafe. People were leaving their strollers outside on the sidewalk. It was clean. It was safe. It worked. Uh, the food was healthy. It was cold and it was dark. Um, but you know, I, I, I was like, I could live here, you know, and I, I, you know, people that are in, in California right now, they, I mean, they're, they're having a tough, tough time, you know, like there's a, a terrible homeless problem there. The wildfires are terrible. And, and oftentimes there's, you know, smoke filled skies for days at a time. Um, you know, COVID is really bad, you know, in, in America. So, you know, like it was, it, this was actually pre COVID. Um, but, um, it was, I, I just saw Europe and Finland as this like great opportunity from a lifestyle standpoint, but then there was this like space company, yeah. you know, sitting in the middle of Finland, uh, with these great, you know, people and founders and, and, you know, it was a data business, which, which I'm really passionate about. And so, you know, I've, I feel like I've found like a, um, a sec, you know, a, a, a second half of my life, you know, like out, you know, I've left America. I live in Europe now. I really enjoy it. Um, I recommend it to people. You know, what's amazing to me is that, you know, uh, America's really good at business. It's good at, um, well, I wouldn't say it's good at war. I would say it has a, an impressive war machine. Um, and, uh, you know, people work very hard there and uh, there's amazing innovation. Um, but you know, you what's been amazing to me about Europe is that it's really centered around human well being a lot yeah. more. It might not feel like that to a European, but to an American, it really does. And, um, working at a European company has felt very different to me and, much more human experience, I would say. Uh, we talk about psychological safety quite a bit in in ISI, and you know we try to live that. And I, I feel like man, the people around me that live that, my boss lives it. Um, yeah, and so yeah, that's that's where we're at. I, I, I wound <laughs> up in Finland at a space company somehow, and I'm actually really really loving it. And you, one of the things you ask as well in I think in the interviews and that you mentioned in the article is you ask people where they see themselves in five years. Um, so where do you see yourself in five years? You know, as I mentioned to you, um, taking a company public is a mm -hmm. huge, uh, checkbox for me. It's that gold medal at the Olympics, uh, in my mind. So I hope I'm on the other side of that, honestly. Um, you know, I, I, I will work at ISI as long as they'll have me. Um, I, obviously I'd like my career to kind of, you know, morph into other things. I don't want to just keep doing the same thing. Um, but you know, uh, I would say that whether I'm, this is at ISI or after ISI, um, I'd like to be, you know, contributing to young people's success yeah. as much as I can. Um, it, you know, I, I've got this expertise, you know, I, I didn't plan on it. Um, but I, I know, you know, how to start a company and I, I know how to start a technology company. You know, I've got more experience that, in that than I've, I've ever seen anybody have double of what I've ever, ever seen anybody have. And <clears throat> I want to give that back. Right. Uh, I would like to, you know, when I, when I kind of envision like a, a lovely lifestyle that, you know, maybe post IPO and, you know, I size this wildly successful world monitoring business. Um, I think of, I think of living in Europe. I think of, um, writing a lot. I think of, you know, coaching a lot. Uh, I'd like to sit on, you know, some boards and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, continue to, it, you know, take advantage of this expertise that I've created yeah. over the last, you know, 21 years now. There's a thing that um, I've, I've picked up over the time working with you and, and even just um, throughout this conversation. One of the things that I think you mention a lot that I don't see that many people mention is that you've thought a lot about X and it, it seems like there's a lot of things that you've put a lot of thought about and 
I'm trying to do that a lot and, and I realize it takes time. It takes dedicated thinking time. And I would, I'm curious to know, do you have a process to think? It sounds like a weird question maybe, but do you have something like that where um, you just think about something or how does that happen where you've, you've thought through something? I'd just be really curious to hear about that. It's a great question um, because you do have to create space for it. Uh, I'll never forget um, uh, one of the best bosses I ever had, and I've had some great bosses, um, this guy named Ed Rosich. <clears throat> uh, he was, uh, we were at a start. It was my first startup uh, called Granicus. I was, uh, I guess, three or four years into it, and I had gotten in way over my head. You know, like I, I woke up one day and all of a sudden like 50 people were reporting to me and we had 300 clients and I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, I just kept working harder and harder and harder. <clears throat> and our investors brought in, you know, some mature people, you know, people <laughs> that had much more experience than we did. I was in my 20s. And uh, this guy, Ed, you know, I mean, he, he at one point he goes, you know, he just knew I, I was like trying to prove that I worked hard. He goes, you know, Charlie, you're the hardest working person I've ever seen. And he said it in this way where I was like, are you making fun of me? Or are you yeah. complimenting me? And, you know, he, he asked me shortly after that statement, you know, because I, I think he didn't want me to try to prove that I was working hard because he didn't need to know that he, he didn't want me to be the hardest working person in the company. He asked me, when do you think? And I go, what do you mean? <laughs> I didn't even know what he meant. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, when do you sit down and actually think? I go, I don't. And I was like, he goes, you know, you might want to change that. You know, this is a thinking job. It's not just a doing job. <clears throat> and so the space that I have, I've, I've got two things that I do, um, which is, uh, allows me to think. Number one, um, and this speaks to the kind of somewhat unhealthy work, work life of startups is Sundays are my thinking days for work. Um, and so, you know, I will carve out, um, I, the gift that I give to myself on Sunday is that I, I focus on the exciting intellectual challenges that I'm faced with. Okay. Um, and it's actually both in my personal life and my professional life. So in my personal life, I always have a, <laughs> a, a deck called my compass. It's a, it's a presentation deck that is like, you know, how I'm managing my personal life. And I will sit down and I will have a meeting with myself and I'll, uh, um, you know, kind of assess how I'm doing personally right. as a, as a person. And this is like everything from, you know, am I exercising enough to, am I avoiding, you know, the second suffering, which is that like, you know, when you go home at night and you beat yourself up because of some meeting, you didn't say the right thing. in, you know, I really try to avoid the second suffering. Um, and then also for work, you know, it becomes this nice, lovely moment where I get to say to myself, what's the thing that isn't email that isn't, you know, doing writing a document or something like that, that's going to give me leverage, you know, what do I need to think about today and like explore and maybe like, you know, whiteboard or just, you know, start brainstorming ideas, you know, problems that we have that we need to solve or, you know. I don't know. So I create space on Sundays. I also, the other tool I have, we, we were talking, we were, when we went to the pen store earlier today here in the Hague, um, I love using paper and pencil or excuse me, pen and paper. Um, it's a great way to think, I think, <laughs> uh, you know, it allows me to write down, you know, what is going on and what needs to be done, but it also allows you to kind of s sit back and say, well, what's actually important right now? Yeah. Because I think a mistake you can make in any business, um, but especially a startup, is you can run your day through email and Slack and all that stuff. And email and Slack is what everybody else wants from you. And, you know, my, my book and my pen, it's what I want to get done and what I think is important. And I, 
I make sure I, I kind of use that tool and that's why I do buy nice pens and I do buy nice um, little notebooks. Um, I was going to ask, like you were mentioning that brainstorming, like if you had a process of, of like what that physically looked like, I'm guessing that's also just writing down. Brainstorming? Yeah. You know, what's interesting is like when you're in startups for a while, I think you get really good at like, you know, being very it, like lean and iterative and, you know, coming up with back of the napkin solutions to things and by back of the napkin i mean like you just sketch something out really quick and you just have to start trying things right so what you end up doing is you you run experiments all week long every day all day and so you know the way i think about it is like okay you you kind of come up with a hype with a hypothesis you're like i think that if we did this our clients would be more successful and then you got to say you don't have the luxury of, of taking two months and doing that. Yeah. At a big company, you do because it's got to be perfect. You can't, you know, take these risks and you have, you have the time. In a startup, you do not have the time. You, you, ha you have to move fast. And so you got you to gotta come up with, you know, you got to use your gut and you got to find ways to quickly get information out of people um, and synthesize it down and go, you know, and then you run it for two weeks and then you, you, you decide what's broken and not working. You decide what is working and you just get rid of the stuff that's not working real quick. And then you double down on the stuff that is, and you just keep going through that iterative process. Um, I feel like that's, um, uh, you know, something I've, I've, uh, been able to, you know, do quite a bit of in my career and I, I enjoy it and uh, I feel like uh, it's a strength of mine. So so just getting back, how does that brainstorming actually look like? I mean, if, if, if you're comfortable going there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Do you have like a, a physical whiteboard at home, for example? Like I know that's that's something oh, yeah. that, that people do. I, I, I'm just asking that because I think that's a, a thing where usually people talk about like, yeah, I take time. But like, I'm, I'm curious to what does that actually look like? I know some people have a little bit of a ritual where they like going out in a cafe. They go to the same cafe. They take the same thing. They sit there and they just write something. Some people have this like wild whiteboard at home and they just throw stuff up or a wall with post-its i've done that um and, and i'm just curious like what does kind of that letting your brain loose what does that process look like it's definitely not with a computer okay it never starts with a computer okay i actually hate computers <laughs> um, i can't relate to that I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if i my perfect day would be like i wouldn't even have a computer but um it, it, I do. I have a drafting table at home. Mm -hmm. I'm not an artist. <laughs> so this drafting table is usually just like me with a marker and a big piece of paper with, you know, ideas. Um, and, and I try to be, again, like when I work at night, <clears throat> you know, that's how it is at a startup. Like you, you do a 10 hour day, um, and then you go to the gym and get some food and oftentimes you just get right yeah. back to it. Right. But I, I tend not to just like do email at night. You know, I try to treat myself with a little respect like Sunday. <laughs> Sunday is a thinking day. You know, the work that I try to do um, after the gym or whatever is problem solving work. Okay. Right. And it's like, you know, I just like to get that big piece of paper down in a black marker. And okay. I like to just like writing down, you know, I kind of. I go through, I, here's how it goes. It's a, um, uh, uh, I, I keep the aperture really wide in the beginning. Di I diverge first and then converge. Okay. So, and, and that's like kind of a fast way to just like kind of get, get things going. Right. right, right? right. It's like, okay, like there's this problem, you know, let's just write down all the possible ways we could solve this problem. And let's, then let's just start testing each one of those little ideas, pros and cons, or, or you know, um, put them through a mini SWOT analysis, but 15 minutes, like, right, okay. not like 15 days. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, t I try to not make any decisions that night. Okay. You know, I'll just like kind of fold up all these pieces of paper and put them in my bag, and go to sleep, 
and wake up the next morning and like I'll pull the paper out at work and people are like, what what is he doing with these big mm-hmm. and it looks like the rantings of a madman, right? It's just like all this <laughs> marker and stuff like that. And uh, you know, I would say that 85% of it I end up striking through and not doing anything with. But then there's sometimes some golden nuggets in there where I'm like, huh, you know, maybe we do need to hire this kind of person okay, instead right. of this person, you know, after thinking about it a little bit. And again, though, the funny thing in startups is like very few decisions do you ever feel like 100% on, you yeah. know, because there's just no history. Right. You know, every day you're doing things that have never been done before. And so, you know, I guess the whole thing is iterative, fast. You know, your research is like calling a buddy that, you know, like has, you know, three years of experience in whatever your topic you're on and getting some advice from him or her and then just moving on. Right, right, right. Um, I want to start rounding it up here. Um, when we had lunch, as, as you mentioned together, and you asked me if there's structure in this podcast, I, I, I told you there's two things. There's I, I, I start with the same question and I, I usually finish asking the same thing. And so I, I want to get there. And usually it's just asking if there's anything that you've read, um, a book or, or a podcast or something that you've listened to that you've consumed that you think has been quite impactful and that you think is worth sharing. It can be about whatever. It can be something that you read recently. I just like the idea of um, asking like if there's something that or a movie or whatever that, that comes to mind that you think is impactful and that you think is worth sharing. Yeah, absolutely. So... <clears throat> what's interesting is that, and people are pretty surprised by this. I don't like reading about business at all anymore. Okay. Um, I'm kind of over it, you know, like I've, I've done, cause I was, you know, both, you know, basically addicted to work, you know, and, and working a ton at these startups. Um, and you know, and then I would also read, you know, outside of work about work stuff, you know, for, yeah, yeah. for, for 20 years, you know, and it was about three years ago, um, when I turned 40, uh, that I said, I'm going to, I got to be more dimensional than this, you know, okay. I've got to start getting into, you know, other stuff. And what I found was, um, uh, philosophy. So I absolutely love, um, uh, reading this magazine. It comes out once a quarter. It's called the new philosopher. <clears throat> Have I given you one? No, but we talked about it when I left Finland. Yeah, I I've got two in my bag as I'm on this uh, little journey down here in the uh, the Netherlands with you. Um, so there's two, and what's what's really amazing about this is it's about a 120 page long magazine. There's no advertising in it. It's just beautiful artwork and random article. Not random. It's articles, um, philosophical articles, but it's always on one word. So okay. the one that I'm read before this was the word space and it'll be 130 pages. Each article's like two or three pages long. And it just takes that word from so many different perspectives. Okay. So for example, the space one, of course, touches on outer space, but then it talks about the space in your head and the space that you live in. And, you know, it just like goes on and on. Like there was one about power. And, you know, what does that mean? Like it talked about ethical hacking and it talked about torture and, um, I don't know to sit down and read this and it's a hard copy too. So okay. I love it. And it just, the texture of it is really nice. And the artwork is just amazing. And to be able to sit there and read through, um, you know, these, these topics and through the lens of philosophy, uh, is great. But just like most things, what's so funny, like you talked about, as you're doing these interviews and you're gaining an appreciation for how hard it is to do these kinds of interviews, philosophy is the same thing. The more you, the more you read about it, the more you realize you're never going to learn what this life actually is, yeah. uh, which was kind of disappointing because like I got into it and I was like, <laughs> Oh, if I, if I read philosophy, I'll like, I'll figure out what like yeah. this life is. And, and, and what you, what you learn is that like, we really just don't know what this is anyway. So reading philosophy has been my, um, a, a joy. Cool. I'll put, I'll put a, 
um, that magazine in the show notes. Charles, thanks a lot for, for coming, first of all, here. Um, this is slowly turning into my uh, home studio. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for coming here and, and uh, spending some of your really valuable time with me. This was an incredible conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me and uh, look forward to uh, seeing this, uh, this podcast program of yours uh, blossom. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.